Uh, so, before we start, uh, I have a very important warning for you, because this presentation contains the Internet of Things buzzword, so if, if you think that you're allergic to it, uh, you're attending at your own risk. Uh, so formalities continue. Uh, uh, well, uh, in this very short presentation, uh, I'm going to ask the question that you have already seen on the first slide. So is it actually possible to run a Lang virtual machine using just 32 kilobytes of RAM? I'm going to explain why I asked this question about uh, 18 months ago. And I will obviously try to answer it somehow. Uh, so besides being a speaker right now here, uh, who actually am I? Uh, I have recently graduated from this university, although not this particular faculty. <laughs> uh, for some time now, I also have been uh, working as an Erlang developer at Erlang Solutions, spending most of my, mom, of, most of my time developing stuff related to uh, the Mongoose IM XMPP server. Uh, and also, as you could have read on um, uh, the Lambda Days website, um, I call myself a wannabe embedded hacker. And by this I mean that, well, I have no, actually no theoretical knowledge. I just like to play with cables and stuff. So that's the famous IoT slides. Uh, so the current research shows that right now there are almost 7 billion connected devices around the world. And this number will be even bigger by 2020 and it will reach about 50 billion. So if you think that I made up these numbers, well I also attached some source. <laughs> you think that I made up the source as well. Well, there's one thing that we cannot deny, and that's something that uh, I call uh, something like embedded bubble, uh, which started like about two and a half years ago when the first version of Raspberry Pi was released, and every uh, high-level language programmer started to build uh, its own embedded stuff on top of Raspberry Pi and similar boards. So I was not an exception, and since because of this, I call myself a wannabe embedded hacker. Uh, well, uh, at the same time, actually, I was thinking of my Master of Science project topic. So, uh, well, I thought, what if I actually can uh, write uh, some embedded stuff using Erlang? Well, ob obviously, it would have some pros and cons. Uh, well, pros like mm, I can very easily prototype stuff, and I don't need to worry about memory management, concurrency, <coughs> and so on. Obviously, it would be very slow because uh, of the overhead of garbage collection and uh, yeah. <laughs> so obviously, since this is a research track, I had to do some research. What has been done before in the in, the, in this field? Uh, well, obviously, the Beam uh, virtual machine that well, you run when you type Erl in the command line. Uh, was somehow developed for embedded stuff, for ATM switches, originally. But, well, it uses almost 30 megabytes of RAM if you start it. Just if you start it with OTP loaded. And a little bit less, uh, almost 8 megabytes when you just load the necessary modules. Uh, that was, well, too much for me. <laughs> I wanted to run it uh, on bare metal, so the Raspberry Pi like boards also were not a choice um, since they're using a full fledged OS like Linux or Unix. Uh, yes, at the same time, there was a work, an effort to uh, build uh, INEA OSC Artis uh, uh, port for the Beam Virtual Machine, and well, I thought that was really nice. Uh, unfortunately, the OS itself is a proprietary one. Uh, although the Beam version of for OSE for Inea OSE is mm, uh, is is an open source, so uh, I thought that uh, it's not using the full-fledged OS; it's just a microkernel. So I thought that this is a good way. So I choose another one that is not a proprietary; it's an open source uh, microkernel. So I actually have chosen the FreeRTS microkernel. And I basically decided to write uh, the Erlang VM from scratch. Uh, well, I thought that it's, it's pretty nice. It's using just 230 bytes of RAM when you start it, and the 
5 to 10 kilobytes of flash, if, depending on which modules do you uh, choose. And also provide some useful abstractions, at least in terms of implementing uh, an Erlang VM from scratch, like uh, scheduler or uh, memory management. And I, at that time, I also owned uh, uh, this little thing, an LPC7069 micro microcontroller with 32-bit ARM Cortex-M3 CPU on, on board. And that was the only uh, ARM that I owned, so I ch chose this one. <laughs> uh, so it has got 512 kilobytes of flash and 32 kilobytes of RAM. Okay, uh, let me take you uh, on a journey through how my machine was actually developed. But this is uh, every textbook, every airline textbook example of a simple module that I bet most of you can implement it, test it, and, and compile it and test it in like two or three minutes, or even less. Uh, simple factorial uh, calculator function that calculates uh, factorial value. Uh, however, what I wanted to do was uh, to simply compile an Erlang module on my laptop, like this one, and execute it on an embedded machine. So, uh, well, the code that you have seen on the previous slide is not something that the Erlang game understands. Uh, well, it mo it's more similar to this. Uh, well, it's a human-readable version of, of uh, bytecode. Well, so the machine must have execute something like that. So as you can see, even though the, uh, the code was pretty simple to execute, it already needed to implement uh, some basic stuff, some b basic building blocks, like code loader to load what you have seen on the previous slide, and some kind of bytecode interpreter that actually interpreted those opcodes. And at the time I had 10 opcodes implemented after this stage one, out of a total of around 150. And also because I didn't want to, uh, well, calculate just a factorial of 11, which is the maximum number that fits on 32 bits, uh, I needed to implement the big number arithmetic that goes, uh, it goes out of the box with Bing. And also I had to garbage collect it somehow. <coughs> So, uh, simple garbage collector was also implemented. So, as you can see, after this stage one, uh, I could have executed a very basic sequential code. So, if you think that in, in the further steps I was able to uh, implement a rocket launcher or Mars Pathfinder, then I unfortunately need to disappoint you, because this is the most complex, complex thing that I was able to run on it. And it's, a, well, a little bit more complex than it might, might look on the first side, because this is actually what happens here. Well, if you think of it in terms of the OTP uh, supervision tree, then forget it, because it has nothing to do with OTP, as it, it doesn't fit <laughs> inside. Uh, so what happens here, basically, there are four processes running, uh, supervisor process and three worker processes. A wor each worker processes has got its own <coughs> green LED connected to it. Now, a uh, supervisor, every 500 milliseconds, chooses a random worker process, sends a message to it, and if a worker process receives a message, it simply toggles the state of a green LED. Now, if a worker process doesn't receive a message for 1.5 seconds, so three full three cycles, then it simply exits. And since the supervisor is, uh, is dropping exits and is linked to worker processes, it receives a message that the worker process is down. It turns on the red LED that is sitting next to the green LED, waits a second, restarts the worker process, and turns off the red LED. Simple. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, it's not the uh, rocket science, as I have said, but at this, after this stage, the machine uh, gained, well, 43 opcodes. Uh, as, you, as you can see, uh, it was able to execute some parallel code uh, on top of the free air tosses scheduler and tasks. And also, as you could have seen, links and message passing somehow was implemented. And also the timers based on top of the real time, uh, not the real time, the, the hardware clocks in the microcontroller and some built-in functions uh, that uh, were controlling GPIO for toggling the LED states. 
So uh, the third and final example, uh, a radio fr frequency uh, somehow connected, uh, well, it's a more practical thing. I had a ch very cheap 2.4 gigahertz transceiver. Uh, it's called RFN70. It costs about a euro. Uh, and it's, it's controlled by the spy bus. And I actually had a uh, driver written in Erlang that was running on top of the Raspberry Pi. So I simply ported it. Uh, well, I had to uh, switch all binary operations to lists because my VM doesn't support binaries. Uh, I also had to, well, get rid of the OTP and use uh, bank and uh, receive instead. Well, but it was working. It was talking to uh, another uh, microcontroller using the same, the same, uh, micro, the same uh, radio frequency frequency model. It was Atomiga. Right. Uh, so uh, actually, the machine haven't gained much. Just the spy bus driver and the interrupt controller, because this RFM70 works. If a message comes, it generates an interrupt. So somehow I could have needed to translate an interrupt to a Erlang message. Uh, well, so since this is a research track, that's uh, another obligatory slide. Uh, I'll do it in the reverse order. So uh, in the long term, I would really love to. Uh, that if my VM was able to talk to a full-fledged beam uh, somehow, to a cluster of big VMs and even uh, make a cluster out of a couple of uh, microcontroller VMs, that's a long-term goal, a mid-term goal. Uh, well, actually move to something a little bit more powerful because you know, 32 kilobytes is fun to play with, to get out of your comfort zone when you can, where you can uh, allocate as many memo as much memory as you want, uh, but if because uh, th this uh, let example was actually using 23, 24 kilobytes of RAM, uh, and the most of it was uh, loaded code, uh, and that's actually the upper limit for for that for this microcontroller because of how garbage collector works, uh, it leads to fragmentation of memory. So that's kind of the upper limit. Well. Uh, I will let you ask some questions just in a second, but there's probably one that you have uh, on the tip of your tongues. Uh, well, actually, what's in it for me? Uh, he's talking about this stuff, and apparently it somehow works, but uh, how can I use it? And how can I contribute? And so on. And actually, right now you cannot. <laughs> Today you cannot, but in just 19 days, uh, you will be able to do that due to some uh, well, tactical reasons, I would say. So the very short end goal is to open source it on March 17th. As I said, due to some tactical reasons. And uh, there is an empty repository there. You'll find the code, as I said, on March 17th, but you can, you can start it today. <laughs> okay. Do you have any questions? Okay, so that is the questions. Um, I was a bit puzzled. Uh, it seems like you implement a virtual machine and you run Erlang on top of that. So your main goal was making a virtual machine, is that correct? Yes. So why not run Java, for example? Or... Uh, I don't know Java. Oh, okay. <laughs> I just know Erlang. And, uh, there are also hardware platforms that already support virtual machines. So why, why this work? Is there some research uh, focus? Uh, well, not really research focused. Okay. Just uh, main goal was uh, for fun. Okay. And good, good, good to idea. actually let uh, to learn as many as possible by the airline Beam VM itself. Okay. By uh, somehow re-implementing it. <laughs> Thank you. Kevin. <laughs> Uh, hi, Raphael. Hi. Not a lot of fun. I've done something a bit similar with Hume in the past. So I've got one question for you. Why 32K? Uh, Why so big? Serious, <laughs> <laughs> Serious. Uh, that's the only uh, microcontroller that I owned. It was using 32 
Bates, uh, another question? Yeah, it's a, uh, it's a 32 bits uh, instruction. Uh, actually, Erlang is, well, I, I didn't want to re re redesign the Erlang VM from scratch, I just wanted to re implement it. And the design is like, uh, you need to have at least 32 bits, I think. Okay, okay, but the question is, do you need all 32K for your VM? But if it's the VM that requires you to use the 32K, um, could you maybe compress it in, into even less space? Yes, I think yes. But I think this would need, this would require to uh, re-implement a little bit how the compiler works and how the instruction set looks like. Because uh, uh, as I said, mm, the most of the memory was taken, consumed by uh, the loaded code, the loaded modules. Okay. Like every opcode con consumes 32 bits, and every operand consumes 32 bits. So it was 50% uh, of memory was consumed by uh, four loaded modules. Right. Yeah, yes, because I know that when I've done this myself, one of the problems is the runtime system, how much space the runtime takes. Yes. So, for example, uh, you might have to do without luxuries like being able to print floating point numbers. <laughs> a luxury, yes. I, I managed to say, it was surprising, I managed to say something like 32K or 16K from runtime by not printing floating point numbers. But that involved rewriting the printf library in C. It was a bit of a pain. <laughs> right, do you have any more questions? All right, so I think uh, it's a great time to thank our speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, we are falling behind. Be aware, the lunch has already started. So.